Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about resilience and change, and it's something both of us have experienced personally and professionally, and we do quite a lot of work on. So you're all very welcome. We're going to get stuck straight into it. I think Dermot and myself can tell you a little bit about who we are and why we're here, perhaps, near the end. But I'm aware it's probably lunchtime for some of you. So we'll get cracking on. So 2020, what a year. <laughs> what a year. I, I think there's never been a year like it, and I'd like to think there never will be. And uh, it, it's been some year that has affected everybody globally, and we've never quite had such um, a global impacting situation before as we've had this year on many, many levels. And the weather this week and last week hasn't really helped with that either. So it, it's been a challenging year in many, many, many ways. And one thing that Dermot and I have definitely seen, and we talk, every time we talk, we marvel at the resilience of people. And I think people don't really realize just how resilient, how resilient we are. This year so far, and we're only entering into the second half of this year, we've seen uncertainty, we've seen change, we've seen challenges, we've seen stress. And it's it, this isn't even about your personal beliefs or where you've come from or what you're necessarily bringing to work or not, or whether you're still working or not. I think no matter what has happened for you and your family this year, you have experienced these things. And that's why we thought it would be very important to just talk through change, change management, and resilience and, and how you can kind of develop some self-care tools to remind yourself in the second half of 2020. So Thanks. I'm yep. going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Julian. Yes, I'm sure we'll let's start off talking about COVID-19. I'm sure it got for me, it seems like a year ago this has all happened because so much has changed since COVID-19 was uh, affected us all. And it's amazing that such a small virus could stop the worldwide. Well, if you can all remember, probably reflect back what happened to you at this time. What, how had this affected you? Did the job shut down, unemployment and family members, yourself, etc.? Because this really had an immense impact on our well-being. Emotionally, a lot of people probably were the first time who I've been working with in my therapy practice have experienced unemployment and emotional shame they were experiencing, the depression they were experiencing was immense. Physically, a lot of our gyms, for example, shut down, you know, so we had nowhere really to go, for example, to a gym. We all had good intentions of looking after our physical health. Me for one, yes, I'll get on that gym online, no problem. Did I? Not really, no. My running did slip as well, but I've recently got back into it. And of course, more worrying is financially. A lot of people were worrying about the financial aspects of their lives. Many people who I talk to and who I know outside the therapy room, their job for the first time was put on predictive notice. Um, they had to look at their financial costs for the first time. They had to look at their bank statements. They look at their bank accounts. They were overwhelmed by it. So the impact of COVID-19 was immense on our well-being, both emotionally, physically, and financially. So Julian, next slide, please. So if we have got over that and we adapted, I was talking with Christina before a call here, me personally in my practice, that's part of Under the Rainbow, I lost 60% of my clients and we in Under the Rainbow lost all our corporate gigs. So we were really had to adapt and me and my therapy practice in Inner Voice had to adapt online quickly. And luckily for me, I had a client previously and I was used to online, so I could adapt and all my clients are coming back. So brilliant, I got on top of things and I'm loving online world, I'm loving everything. But now again, we enter into another uncentered period. Our country is beginning to open up, is beginning to open up shops, open up business. But how are we going to do things? How are we going to do our business now? Are we going to incorporate online and offline? Will my job be, I'm talking to people again, will my job now would be, am I going back into the office in September? Am I going back in January? I do not know. How will my office look after my mental health and physical health? How will they look after the way I'm working? Will I have support? So it's an awful lot of uncertainty now happening again as the country opens up again. And there's a lot of talk out there, being an ex-accountant, a lot of talk about economic 
are we going into more a recession? So again, we're coming into more uncertainty, more challenging times, that during this presentation, we will show you ways of looking after yourself. So Gillian, next slide, thank you. So we're gonna talk about, for you to look after yourself, we really need to have a look at control. Um, I will share the results of the survey in a bit, but nobody here who answered or responded to the survey um, likes to hand over total control. And I think that's kind of important for us to appreciate about each other, whatever about knowing that about ourselves. There's this understanding that when we feel in control of things, we feel that we can manage better. And there's a reason for that. We psychologically feel safer when we have control of things. And in the way the environment has gone, the environment, the world, the economy, and maybe with people's health, health of people we know and people we care about, it's just been a very uncertain year and we have not had control. And there is a lot of debate and I'm sure everybody's seen it um, if you go onto social media at all there's a lot of debate about the pros and cons of whether what's been happening is a conspiracy and a tool designed to control people or not and we're not here to talk about that because Dermot and I thankfully are on the same page so in our workplace we don't have that disagreement but it's all over social media and it, it just raises again this question of control nobody likes to be controlled and yet we all like to be in control so how can you reconcile that how do you balance that and i think when it comes to control as well when you feel more in control you feel that you're mentally more prepared to take on things of uncertainty or to meet the unpredictable or to manage stressful situations but as, as 2020 has shown us there's no way we can control everything we can actually control a lot less than we, we really want to think that we can. So I would encourage you that when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, the first place to start is even just sit down with a pen and paper or a keyboard is fine, but I, I'm old school, I like the old pen and paper, and to write out, well, what is within your control and your influence? What is within your influence and not your control and what's outside of your control and outside of your influence? Because I'm sure everybody's heard that phrase, um, give me the strength to change what I can't control or to control what I can change, I think it comes from a prayer. But when you look at, okay, what is within your control or within your influence, really the only thing you can control is you. You cannot control anybody outside of you. You cannot control the environment. You cannot control the global economy on a singular individual level. While small changes have so much power, we also need to be real about what we can and can't control. So what we can control is how we react to other people. We can control our actions, our behaviours, our attitudes, and with a bit of challenge, we can control our values and our beliefs. We may need to question them and challenge them, but we can have control over that. What I mean by you can influence but not control, that may extend to other people, and I'm sure if any of you are in a management role, you understand what I mean by influence but not control. Um, and, and as somebody who's come from a corporate background in management, that's very much familiar to me. So we can influence our environment, but we can't control it. Look at the weather. Look at the weather. Anyway, we can influence other people's moods. We can be definitely influential over we pick someone up or put someone down. We can influence the commitment that we make to other people and whether we meet that commitment and whether we meet that promise or not. Sometimes things happen outside of our control, but we definitely have influence and we can influence our own health mentally and physically. We might not be able to control it. We can definitely do something to empower ourselves to have influence over our own selves physically and mentally. So the things outside of our control and other people, I've mentioned the weather, um, or outside of our control or influence. I've mentioned whether obviously a Freudian slip there, other people, we just cannot control other people. Yes, we can influence to a degree, but in a workplace, that degree is very limited. It's within your, your the premise of your working environment. And even within that, you can't control somebody else at all. So we need to accept there are things that we just can't influence and can't control. The economy, the weather, politics, <laughs> global pandemics, and all of those kind of things. So control is very much, it's, it's the key to psychological safety. 
And when you can kind of understand just how important control is to you and all of the things that you try and put energy into controlling and really question, like, are you wasting energy in trying to control something that is just, you, you will never be able to get on top of. And if you get that realization, it actually can be quite a light bulb moment because as I said, the only thing you can control is yourself. That's it. And on an individual level, we have 80,000 thoughts on average. So some, some might have the blessing of thinking less. We've 80,000 thoughts a day going through our head. You think we can control all of those? Even when it comes to self-control, there's no way we can control, never mind, notice 80,000 thoughts in a day. So it's very important that we are also quite, quite self-aware and realize that we're wired to survive. When we are in control of things, we feel a lot more capable. We feel empowered and we feel a lot safer. This is our key primal wiring to survive in life. But again, it brings it back to what we can't control. When we feel out of control, we feel unsafe. But you can control yourself. And we will talk about that in a bit, about the little things you can do to bring control back to yourself and to manage your own life. And when we say for personal success, we literally quite mean that. So change. It's been a year of change. It's been a very challenging year. And most people in this group uh, seem to do well with change. This is, there's this idea of change. This is the change curve or the change graph. And I'm, I'm wondering if some of you are familiar with this. This is the Kubler-Ross change curve. And psychologically, this is apparently how we respond to change. And there's quite a pattern to this. We don't necessarily go through all of the steps from start to finish. You might enter at the anger piece. You might enter at the letting go piece. But there's a process with all change. And every change brings an ending and a beginning. Every change. And we, we often just go through, like, we change every day. Without change, there wouldn't be evolution. Change happens whether we want it to or not. And without change, we wouldn't develop. Like I talked about human beings being wired to survive. Human evolution has spanned over 5 million years. It's, it's, it's quite something when you get into the development of who us as we are today. And change is basically the reason we're all sitting here having this conversation. So the idea of what change is and how it happens, we do have a psychological adaptation to change. And it all really comes back to our comfort zone because we like, which again, feeds into control. We like to keep things within our comfort zone. We like to be familiar with the things we can control. And when things move into change and go out of our comfort zone, there's usually a shock because the world suddenly feels unfamiliar. And I remember the weekend before uh, St. Patrick's Day, and it's great that we have that landmark, things changed. Everything closed and it was a massive change. And again, things are changing, but we're being eased back into what everybody's calling the new norm. But I just, before I move on, I want to really kind of like stress this point. With every change, no matter how well-meaning it is, no matter how invited and welcome it is, every change also means loss. And I just think that there's a very very deep loss in what's been happening on an individual level for a lot of people, whether it's personal, uh, as Dermot was talking about, the emotional, the physical, as I said, I, I've, I've lost, I've given up <laughs> the idea of personal exercise. Now I, I'm doing other things, I haven't given up entirely, but my, my, uh, I have a cross trainer and I have an exercise bike and both have become kind of close horses because my office, my home office was like a storage room and I've had to restore that as has my home office. So uh, a little tiny minor changes. But again, it's the loss of something. And that might mean grief. And that might mean a process. And we often bypass that process because it's uncomfortable. And we rush to being, hey, everything is okay. But for some people, they've lost loved ones. They might have lost their job. They might have lost, maybe there's been a reduction in salary. With every change, even the positive ones, there's a loss of something. And I think that's very important that we just don't bypass a potential process for grief that might need to be acknowledged as well. So I asked about decision-making and we got a good variety of things around this. Decisions are one of the best ways for us to feel in control of something. We make decisions 
all of the time. If I were to ask you already today, and feel free to pop it into the chat, how many decisions do you feel you've made already today? I mean, what's it? What's it? Quarter past 12? 22, 12, 22. Are you aware at all of the amount of decisions you've already made today? Probably not, because we do things on autopilot. Those 80,000 thoughts a day that's going on in your head, as I said, how many of those are conscious or cognitive? So we make umpteen decisions without cognitively actually thinking about it. And a lot of people will say, oh, I make decisions using my brain, or I make just the strategic decisions. And yes, no doubt you do, but not every decision. And we use a combination of our brain, gut, and heart really to make decisions. And if you've ever been stuck with a decision um, and sat down and written the pros and the cons, uh, and I've, I've done this quite a lot over throughout the course of my career, more often than not, I, I, the pros and cons was just a way of me getting the thoughts from my head onto paper. It didn't really result in the the winning list, the bigger list being the decision I made. I already knew in my gut what decision I was going for, but I was trying to rationalize it and, and make it logical. And, and I swear with feeling, I do do decisions with my heart. But the idea of our brain being just in here is kind of a myth because we have an entire nervous system that our brain dictates to. So our brain, our heart and our gut are all connected physiologically through our nervous system and they communicate to each other. So we don't just think, we think with our heart because our feelings lead our decisions and lead our choices and lead how we go through life. And our gut does as well. And people talk about the gut as being a feeling, but your sense of identity actually comes from your gut. That sense of knowing who I am. That whole idea of your self-preservation that your values, who I am as an individual, what I stand for, that tends to come from the gut. And if you break it down into the science of the nervous system, the part that lights up the most when we're actively making decisions usually does come from a gut place. Granted, the heart and the brain have a say in it too, but when you're kind of making a decision from your heart, it's emotive. Um, or that's the understanding that when, when we're thinking with the heart, and people often argue about the heart-brain uh, disagreement or conflict the relationships when you're making a harsh decision it's a decision based on relationships based on emotions based on feelings and also based on what other people think of me because it matters I, I want to be thought of well so the harsh decisions also have a big impact to play into how we manage our lives and your brain yeah, those strategic decisions, the logical thought process, cognitive function, thinking things out, you know, being logical, giving meaning to things, making meaning of life. It's very important that we make decisions really from a place of all three. And we can only do that when we bring awareness to our decisions. As I said, there is not a single person on this call today who hasn't made a decision so far today. But how conscious was it and how aware of you were of that decision? So when it comes to managing change, and coping with feeling things are out of control. I would actually suggest very simply to sit down, as I said, pen and paper or whatever way, phone even, the, the notes function on the phone, and start typing out or writing out the decisions and doing either a mind map or like a decision tree. It's not that it will influence the decisions you make, but it will give you a sense of control because you'll be visually able to see what's presented in front of you. And it'll give you much more of a sense of your options that are available to you and being in the driver's seat over those decision-making activities. And when it's not in your head and it's on paper, it also calms down the brain a little bit. You're not thinking over things as much. And I'm sure everybody's gone to bed and you've, you've been lying there in bed and suddenly your brain has started thinking, oh, what if, and I have to do this, and what, what do I do, and should I, would I, could I? Writing it out and brainstorming out those thoughts especially before bed, really do help. And I know Dermot's going to talk a bit about sleep. So we're going to move on. Dermot, would you like to take over? I feel like I've talked a lot. No. <laughs> well, you're going to give some lovely statistics, but about this, this stress, the burnout, anxiety, and depression, just to, I'd like to share my story, um, how I actually became a therapist. Oops, sorry. Oops. No worries. Uh, the last massive recession that we had, 2009. Um, well, I was an accountant in a corporate environment, going up the ladder, no problem, um, really excelling, and I was 
always on my way up, absolutely, you know. Had felt that I was going to be a financial controller one of these days of a top pharmaceutical company. And you are. Oh, good, yes, I am, CFO. How, how it goes full circle, it's amazing. But back then, anyway, I was going up the ladder and felt, ah, oh, no, um, this package came on board. Uh, I lost my job. Um, I said, I'll get this massive package. I'll have no problem getting another job. And um, I was totally wrong. Uh, and about, yeah, probably six weeks later, I did get a part-time role and that was grand, but I knew there was something not quite right. And then from that part-time role to another year, I got, it took me another year about to get an accountancy role. And by God, I got rejected, rejected, rejected. And I remember one morning just going down. Woke up one morning with that dark cloud over me. And I said, what is the point in getting up? What is the point? What is the point? What's my life? Who am I? Um, and as Gillian rightly said, I'm looking back now, there was a grief process starting. I had lost my identity. My identity actually was my job to say that the accountant, I hid behind accountancy, to be honest. I hid behind that because back then I thought to be a man, you had to be an accountant. And basically I was hiding my sexual orientation under that. I've been an accountant, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone, I'll be in my books, just hide behind my books and you don't have to ask any questions about me. So am I glad that happened so long ago? Yes, I am. I did go through depression. It was awful, don't get me wrong. But it made me, give me a push to reach out, reach out for help, which I want to mention further down the road. I did reach out for a therapist at the time um, and I started my recovery. And she actually wrote in her notes that you're on your way to be a therapist. And she disclosed that to me and I, I am, but I am. I love what I'm doing. I love what we're, the work we're doing and I'm the rainbow. But for me, my depression helped me find who I was. Um, I had totally lost myself in that accountancy role. I believed I was the main man, but thanks to depression, it gave me, I found my true self. No, I'm not like saying it was lovely and rosary. It was tough, tough work to get where I am. Going to therapy every day and working out and mentally working out and dealing with the stuff, the shame and guilt that was coming up for me at the time. Dealing with it was tough, but I got through it. So, I will be talking down in later on about tips that I give to my clients I work with, but they're tips that I put into practice and they're tips that I use to get me out from the hole, the dark hole that I was in, to get me on board my recovery, to get me on board to find who I really am and to find a position that I really love and to basically really connect with who I am. So. We have tips coming down the road um, on this presentation. I'd like to share with you. But Julia, glad you give. Thank you. Before we move on to Dermot's amazing tips, um, I just want to tell you something that's potentially, and I'm not saying this for, I'm not a fan of sensationalism, so I'm not saying this for shock factor, but workplace stress doubled doubled between 2010 and 2015 and that's according to the irish economic and social research institute it has more than doubled again between 2015 and 2020. so our workplace stress is increasing at a phenomenal rate and there are a lot of people, and I admittedly, um, anyone who knows me or has worked with me will know this, I'm one of these people who, quote unquote, thrive on stress, okay? And I do, but in small doses, and studying stress has given me the best coping mechanism and been able to recognize and deal with my own stress and overwhelm, because stress, what it does to the body is worse than any other global pandemic and it, it's be going it's going to become people are saying stress is becoming the new biggest killer and it will because stress what it does to your body and your nervous system it floods the body with stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline now there's good stress and there's bad stress and this is not a talk solely focused on stress we do day-long workshops on stress management mm -hmm. but there are good stresses and bad stresses and stress is not bad again we wouldn't have evolved Human beings would not be sitting here with technology and, and the kind of stressful lives that we have if stress hadn't have pushed us 
to evolve. The whole idea of wired to survive means we have to have stress. We have to experience stressful environments in order to invite change to evolve and grow and develop. So stress isn't bad, but the badness happens when we don't come down from stress, when we don't let our body de-stress, let those hormones of cortisol and adrenaline leave our body and just come back to basic. So if you thrive on stress or you're like me and you work well under pressure, that's great, provided you give yourself the gap afterwards to come back down. Otherwise, you end up on a high and almost in a loop where you're addicted to the stress hormones. And it looks the very same as anxiety. And I find with a lot of younger people I work with as a therapist, they're not able to differentiate between anxiety and stress. So when somebody young says I'm stressed, they may actually be saying I'm anxious. And it's very hard to differentiate. And I think that's why our statistics on stress are increasing so much as well. That we don't have the tools or we're losing the tools to cope and manage. We're losing the ability to let go and to just be and to ground and come back to centre. And with, regarding statistics, I can, I can, well, I love, I love numbers. I love science. I'm a big science fan, um, and I can quote statistics till you're all snoozing. So I'm not going to bore you too much with the numbers. But when we talk mental health, we're not talking mental illness. Then I just want to really stress that there's a huge difference between mental health and mental illness. Every single person has mental health. It's no different to your physical health. And I think it's really important that we just get our heads around that because when we're talking mental health, you have it, I have it, we all have it. Mental fitness, then when you think of it as mental fitness, because there's no problem saying, I go to the gym, I work out. We commented on an exercise bike on one of the attendees like, and how mine is a clothes horse. There's no shame in talking about mental, uh, physical fitness. And yet we're reluctant to have conversations around mental fitness because we associate the words mental health with mental illness. Whereas if, if you were to check in and say, physically, how fit do I feel? You'd be able to answer that. If I were to say mentally, how fit do you feel? I wonder, I wonder how quickly you'd be able to give me an answer. So it's just the whole idea of overwhelm, stress, anxiety, and depression. The more you can develop and build your mental fitness and your resilience, the better you'll be able to cope with the the coming epidemics or pandemics of stress, depression, anxiety, and overwhelm and burnout. And they're very, very, very real things because we like to think we can have it all and do it all. And potentially we can, but not all at once. And again, it brings us back to that loss of control. We can't do everything all of the time. We cannot fire on all cylinders 24 seven. Something has to give. And the problem with that is life feels like that game, whack-a-mole. Did you ever see where the, the little holes in the thing where the puppet's coming up true and you have a plastic hammer to try and hit the thing on the head? Very, probably not, <laughs> probably, it's quite a violent game, but you get the concept. It, it, it just feels like you're being attacked from every side. So we need to develop resilience and calm ourselves down and come down in between stress so a little bit a little bit on resilience resilience is something you already have everybody has resilience it's a given human beings have evolved as i said over millions of years so we are the incredibly resilient we are incredibly resilient creatures we really are but resilience is a set of coping skills that dermot's going to talk you through so when it comes to imagining the emotional impact that something's going to have on us we're usually wrong how much time do we worry and fret and stress about what could be and what might be and when the event happens it doesn't impact us as much as we've worried about it so this whole idea of needing to micromanage our entire lives and we're all guilty of it um, and i'll show you the survey results soon every nobody likes to hand over that control but if we all want to be in control then how does that interfere with our relationships with each other and i think that's quite a valid question so we have survived everything that we've worried about for the most part. I'm not, there's the odd exception, perhaps, okay? But we are already have resilience and we're more resilient than we think we are. We're a lot more resilient than we assume we are. And I like to think of resilience as just ordinary magic, something we all have, and it's so ordinary. But wow, it is incredibly powerful. So Dermot, hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, resilience is powerful. And you're so right. We all have it. We all have this. 
we might not realize we have it, but when tough times happen, this is when it kicks in. You may have heard a few of these tips I'm going to give you um, because these are tips that I abide by and I put in. As I said, this helped me beat depression, beat that art dog that was over me. Sleep, I can't stress how sleep, sleep pardon me, is so important. Get that eight hour sleep. It is amazing. I've done some tests on myself, like my own guinea pig saying, when, let's say, what if I get four or five hours sleep, how am I feeling the next day? I feel absolutely rubbish. I really, and I'm really noticing that if I get into a bed routine, like if I'm, if I go to bed after midnight, I'm, you might as well write off the whole day for me the next day because I'm very grouchy, very irritable, and I'm not easy to work with. Well, that's me internally saying that. But sleep is so important for, for you for eight hours, get eight hours and avoid iPhones, social media, at least an hour before you sleep because it affects the brain and you'll be wide awake tossing and turning meditation and mindfulness another great tip to pass on to you and i saw somebody put in the chat serenity prayer fantastic meditation and mindfulness i started really i had no notion of this until i started starting to be a therapist and i actually do this now on a regular basis my boring routine is when i start the day I would do 10 minutes of meditation regardless on YouTube get an app chakras I'm into chakra music listen to it and it gets me going for the morning it really relaxes me and I get to start the day off properly when I get my hour of sleep this fellow I don't know if anybody knows about him Wim Hof incredible man I only got him to know about him only about a few months ago really I uh, did a bit of research, incredible how he used his body and mind and everything else. He walks the Himalayas in a swimsuit. Like, cold does not affect him. It's incredible what he's done. But he's got a fantastic breathing method that I would urge you all to check this out. Because somehow along the way, we lost how to breathe. Not properly, you know, but his method really teaches us how to breathe correctly. And he's a lovely voice. He's very calming. And his method as well of telling you how to breathe is excellent. And he tells you, let out the stress, let in the goodness. It's incredible. I really urge you all, because I start again, this is my routine in the morning that I do. I do meditation and mindfulness, practice it about 10 minutes. Then I do this technique. It only doesn't take that long, actually. It's about five minutes or so. But it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Next slide there, Julian, please. 100 <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's me, yes, in the Olympics. Eventually, I will be. I'm a runner, by the way. I uh, I have got back into, done, how many marathons have I done? Oh, four now. Four. Um, but I want to do, I am getting back into my running. My running slipped, by the way, because a lot of work was happening. We were doing a lot of work adapting to this online. But I noticed, definitely, when I'm back into running, when I do a simple 5K, it is incredible. I, I did it yesterday. I felt a bit overwhelmed. A lot of stuff was coming up, work. And we had a workshop coming up. So I took that 20, on boats now, 20 minutes, 20 minutes and did a 5K run. And it came back refreshed, stress was gone, ready for the workshop. So great to see there's some exercise bikes in the background. And I hope, or if it's a treadmill, um, I hope you're using it and put it into a routine. Put it into your routine, it'd be fantastic. Nourishment, 100%. Really eat good nourishing food. Um, stay away from the takeaways. Yes, have a cheat meal now and again. And treat yourself at the end of the day. Do that. But really, nourishment is a key. Really wholesome food. And even cooking is very creative and also is a great form for meditation and mindfulness as well as a way of connecting with the body and soul. It's incredible too. So definitely, yes, have that takeaway now and again if you want to, but have that nourishing food to nourish the mind, body and soul to take on what's happening, the change, change that's around us. We don't know the uncertainty, take it on. These are the tools that you need in your backpack, let's say. Home office now, people that I worked with um, in my therapy environment, therapy world, let's say, had a very difficult time from going from the office to working at home. They really found it very, very challenging um, because they missed the social reaction, but also they, they had a boundary between home life and work life. 
So if you are still working at home and you may now be going back to the office, but if you are um, working at home, put a routine in place at home, select the room you're going to work in, put on the clothes you're going to wear, for example, for work that you normally work for. And when work finishes at home, take them off, go back into your casual gear. It's a way of switching off. It's simple things of switching off the mind of doing. Um, because you can put a room that is sacred or sacred, sacred for the home work life. So it's not interfering in your personal life. Because many clients I know who probably are in relationships, they found that it was affecting, they were wor working in the living room, you know, and it's affecting um, their work life and their home life. So when that person particularly got a room, set up their office, set up their equipment in there, I worked at home and then left the room, switched it off, were able to go back into their family life, so to speak. So use those methods um, for your home office um, to get a procedure in place, a routine. And routine is key, is key. So next slide there, Julian, please. So our final tips so I'll give you social media. We all are, social media can be good and bad, but social media can be so, like, again, looking at the COVID death rates and COVID outcome rates were causing so much negativity for the clients who are working with. So avoid social media as much as the negative side. Like there's a whole sensation out there saying we're going to be um, a total sensationalization of it all. That's going to be totally negative again. So use social media wisely. Online courses, online courses, if it's just an opportunity, you still have the time, do that online course that you really want to do. Go out there and do it. I've done a few of myself. I took this opportunity to do it. Finally, if you are suffering from mental health and you're feeling stressed on that, there's no harm in reaching out to your GP to talk about it and no harm to reaching out to a therapist. Many therapists include ourselves online, so there's no harm in doing that. And I urge, as a man to another man, please do this. We're still lagging behind. And it's no shame in reaching out and out for your mental health. Next slide there, Julian. So that's us. This is Under Remo. We are a diverse group. We do have our therapy centre. We do have our social enterprise that we do courses for mental health, well-being for the community and outside the community. That's the LGBT community I'm talking about. We also are now heavily involved in doing corporate training for mental well-being fitness. And that will include diversity and belonging inclusion in workforce. So, Lillian, over to I you. have put, there's a last question I want to ask you on menti, menti.com. I've put the code in the chat, but it's menti.com 772427, and I'm going to share the results with you. Um, we hope you got something out of this, but feel free to unmic yourself and join in, because I no doubt there is... Um, a huge amount of experience as it is as there are in the group and I'm just going to very quickly get up brilliant um, yeah while yeah right. while you're doing this I'm going to screen share what's coming up as the best things for self-care so from you mm -hmm. our listeners people participating on this these are some of the suggestions for self-care and it's not too late to join in if you want to. Um, yeah. And this is where we can share with each other. So we know how to look after ourselves, but there's often this reluctance for self-care. Um, it's seen as indulgent or selfish but having said that, if you're not looking after yourself, you can't really look after anybody. And one thing that I've definitely noticed during the last three, four months is the people that you would normally go to to lean on and for support aren't necessarily there or as available because they've been having their own issues and their own struggles. So we've had to step up in our own self-care and become almost lighthouses for other people, those of us that were able to. So I think I love this. I think this is really, really worthwhile to even just look at it and see if there's anything and self-affirmation. Absolutely love that. I do that myself on a on a daily basis as well. 
and I agree. Marcus has put a brilliant YouTube in the link as well. Um, meditation prayer, prayer bowl. I we do do meditation workshops. I've been meditating nearly 30 years, nearly 30 years. So while I say I thrive on stress, that's why I need the meditation. And uh, the Wim Hof method is very good. Mm -hmm. If you're starting off and you don't know, it, it sounds complicated. You can literally just YouTube body scan and it just brings you through the awareness and the connection with yourself and with the body. People think meditation are like orange robes sitting for an hour looking at a blank wall uh, in a pretzel position. And that is not what meditation, yeah, meditation can be that, but that is not what meditation is. Meditation is literally just training the mind to not overthink and just training for stillness, internal stillness and peace. So there are many, many, many different types like thousands of different types of meditation, but it, it can be as easy or as complicated as you want. As Dermot said, cooking, running, walking, there are forms and can be forms of meditation. So I'm loving these. I think this information sharing that we're doing right here is amazing. And it's funny looking at some of these, <laughs> some of these might be anti self care for some people. So pick out the ones like family time. I'm just thinking um, some people have had too much time with family over the last four months, but other, other of us have nearly been deprived from that as well. So just pick and choose the things that work for you. And now what I'm going to do on your phones, if you don't want Menti, I'm just going to show you the results of the other uh, surveys. So I'm going to get rid of this slide, which will remove it from your phones. Bear with me. And I can come back to this, don't worry. So decision making, this is, this is how you're responding. So yeah, most of us do make decisions from the gut. But as I said, how many decisions are you making on a daily basis you're not even aware of? How do you feel about change? So this group here who love change and it keeps things exciting, well done just mind yourself in that as i said there may be a process of grief or loss or adaptation with change and i think just being aware of that and how it might impact you is really useful and then do you like to be in control all of us like to be in control okay so just be mindful of your interactions with others if you like to be in control so does the person you're dealing with and when two people have to be right Usually that means somebody is wrong. So just bear that in mind with how you communicate with each other. And that's us. We'll open the floor to any questions. Yeah, I see gratitude comment there. Writing down what you're grateful for each day does help. And there are a lot of free apps that help with prompts for gratitude and gratitude exercises. And initially it can feel like a chore trying to find three new things every day you're grateful for. It has such an impact. It actually boosts serotonin. Mm. Um, there's a lot of science behind. People say, oh, these are lovely, nice self-care things. There's a lot of science. As I said, I'm a science, absolute science nerd. I like knowing the science behind why we do the things we do. And gratitude actually increases serotonin, which is the main ingredient in the majority of antidepressants. And the same with what Dermot was saying about food and nourishment. Serotonin is produced in the gut. If we're eating healthy foods and cleaner foods, and foods that aren't highly processed, we're able to actually produce our own serotonin a lot easier. I don't know, Marcus, I'd be curious about that too, and I don't know, and I haven't been able to find research on that. The fact that we've got 80,000 thoughts on average per day going through our head, I would say it's even more than two thirds of our choices are unconscious. There are any tips where we can find affirmations to incorporate into our routines. I have got an app. I think it's on this phone um, and it's literally called the affirmations app. And I have, have 30 affirmations in it on a loop. I'm using it. I'm genuinely using this about three years. So I know the affirmations by heart. I still use it even after three years. Are there any tips to dealing with fight or flight when you're in this mode and experiencing burnout? Body scans are good for this, but to be honest, and as somebody who's been meditating for so long, when you're doing a body scan, if you're anxious or highly stressed, a body scan might amplify that feeling because it's bringing you into just the awareness of how stressed you might be feeling. Fight or flight at the end of the day is it, to meditate. We've got 
three, whatever about our nervous system, in our actual brain, we've got three different parts of our brain. And the higher brain is the part that thinks and rationalizes and cognitive functions that's made us the humans we are today. Fight or flight is the primitive brain. It's our very basic primal instincts. So to sit down and meditate when you're in that place is really difficult to do. And a lot of people say, oh, when you're highly anxious, meditate. Yes, but not when you're in that fight or flight mode because your body's activated into something else. And by fight or flight, um, if anybody, I'm sure we've all experienced it. It's that tightness here, the queasiness here, the sweatiness here, the head kind of almost feeling like it's in a vice grip and, and the tension. The reason for that is quite literally the body perceives a sense of threat and sometimes stress does that to us. When we're overstressed, overwhelmed or burnt out, our body's telling our brain there's a threat here. Something is actually at risk in terms of our survival. Now, the reality isn't that, but that's how our body responds. That's why fight or flight happens. So to get rid of that energy, to sit and meditate can make it worse. That the thing I would always say is, is to do something physical because the cortisol and the adrenaline is so high in the body that to actually shift those chemicals out, to do something to dispense some adrenaline. Um, and it depends, when you say fight or flight, it depends on if it's affecting breathing. If your breathing isn't affected, what I actually suggest, and I, I sit here during therapy with clients, and I'll just share this with you. I've got this. It's a little bucket of post-its. And when I have had a particularly difficult situation or conversation or stress or I'm under pressure, and I thrive under pressure, so I, I tend to have quite a chaotic life. This here for me is how I dispense of my fight or flight. And it's 60 second exercises, that's what's in here. Jumping jacks, 60 seconds. And it gets rid of the cortisol and the adrenaline. Plank, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. <laughs> like they're horrible, they're horrible. But in those 60 seconds, it distracts my brain. I get rid of the cortisol and the adrenaline. I time it on my Fitbit, 60 seconds. And then I feel like I've actually done a workout because one minute of me doing the plank, trust me, the sweat's dripping off my nose. And then I'm sitting here and I'm able to, and the anxieties come down. When the primitive brain doesn't feel under threat, then you can start thinking about, well, now I'm going to sit down with my pen and paper and write out the decisions. I'm going to take back control. But when you're in fight or flight, you don't, you don't have that rational thinking. It's a primitive response. So physical movement is one of the best ways to just break that and distraction. Jumping jacks, honestly, 60 seconds of jumping jacks, provided it's not impacting your breathing. If it's impacting your breathing, then you're, you're a little bit more than fight or flight, almost into a panic place. And that, that's different. But again, sometimes bringing in your cognitive brain and what I've done with clients in the past is times tables. If you're feeling almost panic coming in, you're not quite in panic attack, but you're on the, on the way to there. If you start doing your times tables and it brings in, it activates a different part of your brain that's shut down and suddenly you're back in cognitive space again. 